Hi, everyone that is just um, joining. Welcome to this webinar. I see people joining now. We'll get started in, in just a moment, let people get settled first. But uh, if you'd like to say hello, um, just say hi in the chat box. I'm sure people are joining us from all over. So say where you're, um, where you're joining us from, and we will kick off in just a moment's time when a few more people have joined. But um, yeah, please do feel free to say hello. Uh, hi, Amy from London. I'm in London as well. So nice to have a neighbor join. Um, Romania, thank you, Nicola. Thank you for joining. Hi from Somerset Island, Amsterdam. Oh, Rio de Janeiro, right, fantastic. Welcome from Oman, Puglia, Italy. Welcome guys. Hi everyone, welcome to this webinar on Greece's main wine regions. My name is Sam Povey. I'm an educator for the WSET School London. Um, the WSET itself, the Wine and Spirit Education Trust, is the world's leading provider of qualifications and courses in wines, spirits, sake, and now beer. Um, and we've got 50 years of experience in designing and delivering education, um, which I hope many of you have been on some of our courses in the past. Just a quick note to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch via the WSET Global Events Hub on YouTube. If you have any questions at all during this webinar, please put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box, and there'll be some time at the end where I will introduce them. But without further ado, let's, um, let's start having a look at Greece. I'm really excited to be talking about Greece. It's one of the countries that I have um, become incredibly interested in over the last few years. And I was lucky enough, um, lucky enough to visit uh, some wine regions a couple of times last year. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing my, my experience and my, and my knowledge with you. Let's, um, let's get started. If I can just click through onto the next slide with a very, very brief kind of potted history um, of Greece. As many of you will be aware, it, it, has, it is a, it's a country with a very long history of, of producing wine. Um, and in fact, the earliest evidence of winemaking um, goes back more than six millennia to 4,500 BC. There was um, an archaeological dig in Macedonia, so that's in the north of Greece, where they discovered 2,460 grape pips. And we don't know exactly what they did with these, but the suggestion is that if you're gathering that many, that, uh, that number of grapes together, it's probably because you wanted to ferment them. Um, so that's the earliest evidence of winemaking we have. Um, that transformed over the millennia um, into uh, a very sophisticated wine culture. So classical Greece, which is what you might associate with um, the Parthenon, for example, and city-states like Athens, um, Thebes and Sparta, um, was, a, was a wine, they had a wine drinking culture. It was a very, very important part of um, daily life and religious life in particular. So many of you will be aware of of the god Bacchus, who you can see on that um, that uh, sort of clay jar there, um, god of wine, um, amongst many other things. Um, ceremonies to Bacchus involved citywide drunkenness, um, sort of similar to if you were in London during the World Cup. I imagine you saw similar scenes, <laughs> similar scenes in in Athens back then. Um, and the word symposium, for example, comes from the Greek. Uh, that means to drink together. So lots and lots of wine being being drunk here. Um, Greece is also very important because it was the prototype for um, the Romans who, who adopted quite a lot of Greek culture, including their wine drinking. Um, Bacchus, um, uh, sorry, that, uh, sorry, Dionysus, I should say, not Bacchus, Dionysus is the Greek god, becomes known as Bacchus in, um, in the Roman Republic and Empire um, and therefore spreads it all um, along to Western Europe, where it remains today. Um, fast forwarding a little bit, there's quite a lot of turbulence in uh, Greece's more recent history. So uh, Greece is, is under the control of the Ottoman Empire for a very long time, where uh, wine is, is tolerated, but certainly not celebrated. Um, and then after the end of uh, the Ottoman rule, there's, there's quite a significant period of, of political uh, turmoil, including civil war, um, which is not at all very good for um, the wine industry in Greece. Um, however, it emerges in the uh, second half of the 20th century um, and has developed significantly since then. So while 
many people view have a poor view of uh, Greece's wine reputation. Actually, it's improved significantly. Um, and a, a good example of this would be the granting of a PDO status to uh, the region of Naoso, which we'll discuss, um, which has really helped to highlight quality wine production in the country. So let's have a, a brief kind of overview of the growing environment. Generally speaking, um, we have a Mediterranean climate in Greece. So uh, warm, sunny summers, mild winters, and relatively little rainfall. But that can change depending on where we are in Greece. So in the north and inland, um, temperatures can get significantly cooler because of altitude, for example. Um, so for example, Nausa and uh, Amintio that you can see in the in the northwestern corner there, um, have some significant cooling influences. And the flatter regions to the um, east near uh, Thessaloniki, for instance, and also down in uh, the Peloponnese are significantly, um, significantly warmer than that and better suited to high volume wine production. And then, of course, we have the Greek islands. Um, Santorini is highlighted there, but there are many, many islands that have a quite unique and challenging um, growing environment that we will discuss. Before we do so, though, um, a brief word on, on grape varieties. Um, Greece has really uh, rediscovered and embraced a lot of its indigenous grape varieties over the past um, 50 or so years. Um, there are just a handful named on the screen here, and I'll talk in a bit more detail about some of them later on. Um, but to, just to talk about a couple in general, Roditis and Sabatiano um, are both, uh, are generally speaking, white grapes. Roditis is a slightly pink skinned grape variety that is traditionally used for high volume wine production, especially the infamous Retsina, which is a style of white wine that is flavored with pine resin. However, there has been an attempt to um, produce higher quality Roditis that has had success. And one of the keys here is altitude, which provides the moderation that is needed, slow down ripening and produce a more medium bodied, um, riper style of white wine. Um, Savatiano also a kind of a workhorse grape traditionally used very widely in Greece because it's resistant to the drought conditions that are increasingly common. But again, when farmed at lower yields, when farmed at higher altitude, we can get some absolutely fantastic wines, white wines, with lovely high levels of acidity and this gorgeous pear and stone fruit set of aromas. We'll come back to some of these other great varieties, but I did also want to mention that um, from the kind of late uh, 1980s onwards, we began to see a lot of international varieties planted, things like Cabernet, Merlot, Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. Um, these are often actually blended with, uh, with Greek grape varieties um, to produce um, fairly fruity, um, soft, and usually quite enjoyable styles of red and white wines. Um, so particularly successful blends are things like a Merlot with the grape varieties in Amalro, but we'll talk about those in a little bit. So let's um, let's go in and have a little look at the grape um, the grape growing regions themselves. I'm going to start with the islands, which is a very broad category. Um, depending on how you measure an island, uh, Greece has somewhere between 1,200 and 6,000 islands, only 240 of which are inhabited, and they are the traditional home of high quality grape production. There are so many that I cannot possibly talk about all of them, but I did want to spotlight Santorini. Um, which you can see just down here in the um, Aegean. And Santorini is particularly famous for the white wines produced with the grape variety Assertico. So um, in terms of the growing environment in Santorini, it's Mediterranean. It's very, got very, very warm um, summers with extremely low levels of rainfall. But the particular challenge in Santorini is the fact that it's incredibly windy. And as a result, a Certico that is grown on this island is um, trained in a particularly unique way, which you can see on the screen now. So these are called basket vines. And the essential idea is that you train the vine um, around and around to form a basket on the inside of which grow the grapes themselves. So they're protected by the wind. If you tried to trellis these vines like you would in many other vineyards, they would just fall over because the um, the winds here are so powerful. 
The other quite challenging thing about making wine on Santorini is the soil. So Santorini itself is the caldera of an extinct volcano, although that being said, the last eruption was in 1950, um, a, a much smaller eruption than, than we used to have. And these um, volcanic soils are very, very rocky and therefore extremely um, barren in terms of nutrients. So that limits the yield that we can get from a Certico. Um, planting these vines quite far apart, as you can see in this photo, allows us to produce some wine without the, um, without the grapevine themselves actually running out of water. And again, the basket vines are very clever because um, in the morning you get, some, um, you get some humidity, you get some mists, and the basket vines will retain some of that humidity during the day, which will provide a, bit of, a little bit of sucker to um, the vines. So what do the wines taste like? Well, Assertico retains high levels of acidity, um, but also develops quite high levels of alcohol. So it produces this style of white wine that is full bodied, but very fresh at the same time. It's quite an unusual combination. Um, lots of citrus and stone fruit aromas, but also this really strong smoky or flinty characteristic. So it's almost like a really, really full bodied sunset um, and usually for much more reasonable price in my experience. Um, the other style of wine that Santorini is well known for is Vinsanto. And Vinsanto is a sweet style of wine made from late harvested grapes, um, which they will then sun dry. So they'll pick the grapes, they'll put them on straw mats and they'll dry them in the sun. Uh, and that results in a concentration of uh, the sugars, which result in a very, very sweet wine. They'll often age these wines in oak barrels as and they only partly fill those oak barrels so that they oxidize slightly and as a result you get a wine that is, smells of raisins coffee walnuts caramel and chocolate they're very very sweet but balanced by a certico's naturally high acidity so if you do see some of these you're looking for a, an interesting alternative to um, some of the more famous dessert wines i would I'd highly recommend this all right so that is Santorini. Now let me just have a quick look at the Q&A box and see a little bit. Um, so uh, Marcus is here asking, uh, what is, how does this growing, um, what, what is the name of this kind of uh, method? So basket vines, I'm sure there's a, a word for it in Greek, but um, unfortunately I don't speak Greek, so I don't know that word, but uh, yeah, basket vines are what these are called in English at least. Thank you, Marcus, for your question. Okay, let's move a little bit inland. So now we're going to go to the Peloponnese, which is this island down here. Uh, well, not island, but peninsula um, down here. Um, and the, the Peloponnese has the largest proportion of Greece's um, vine plantings, about 30% of its total vineyard area. It's a very mountainous region. So uh, altitude is an essential factor in moderating those extremely warm temperatures that we get in the summer. And we're starting off by looking at the PDO of Nemea. And Nemea's specialty is a grape variety called Agioritico, which I think if I go back a couple of slides, you can see the name of. Let's pop back here. There you go, Agioritico. Right. And um, Agioritico uh, is a black grape variety uh, used to mainly produce red wines. The style changes quite significantly depending on where in Nemea we are and particularly at what altitude. So when we are in the lowest altitude zone, um, we produce, generally speaking, uh, quite inexpensive wines that will be fruity, but not particularly tannic per se. Whereas when we climb um, up into the mountains, we get a little bit more altitude, we see a significant increase in um, the quality that is produced. And these red wines usually have medium acidity with medium to high levels of tannin. Uh, the flavors can be very, very ripe, lots of red fruit flavors, so things like strawberries and cherries, um, with those cheaper styles exhibiting a little bit of a jammy um, aroma. It's quite common that these wines, particularly those higher quality examples, are matured in oak, um, with some producers favoring newer oak for more overt um, aromas and flavors, and other producers favoring larger oak barrels or casks uh, and older oak for a slightly more subtle impact over all. 
All right. And just a couple of questions there. Um, Yagas is asking, is it permitted for the wine to be called Vinsanto? Yeah, the name is very similar to a style of wine they make in Italy in a similar way. The difference is in, in, in Greece, the word Vinsanto is a single word. So it's V-I-N-S-A-T-N-O, one word, whereas in, in Italy, it's two words. Um, a very, very subtle difference indeed. So it, you look carefully on the label if you're if you're buying this wine. Okay. Now, on the other side of the mountain from Nemea is um, Mani, Manitina. And this is just on the other side. It's on this quite high plateau at about 600 meters of altitude. Um, that altitude makes it one of the coolest areas for growing uh, grapes in Greece, which sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but that is the power of altitude here. And um, this area is particularly well known for making a white wine using a grape variety called Moscofilero. And Moscofilero shares quite a lot of similarities with aromatic varieties like Muscat or Gewürztraminer. So it produces wines with this distinct floral aroma, often described as smelling like uh, rose petals, for instance, as well as this quite pleasant spiciness. Unlike grape varieties such as Gewürztraminer, Moscow Moscofilero has high levels of acidity. So it produces a wine that feels quite a bit fresher, uh, as well as a wine with a relatively moderate level of alcohol, usually around 12%. Moscofilero is one of those slightly strange pink skinned grape varieties, a bit like Pinot Gris. And, and that means that a lot of the wines can often have a bit of a pink tinge to them. Um, in some cases, although not permitted within this particular PDO, uh, you might see rosé being produced from Moscofilero or even what looks like a very light bodied red wine. Uh, and I have to say, I've tried a couple in the past and they are absolutely delicious. They just have a little bit of texture, a little bit of grip. One of the things to bear in mind about Greece is that because while it is a very old wine producing country, the recent history, the recent development of the industry has been very rapid. So there's actually quite a lot of innovation happening as well. And, and as a result of that, we see um, lots of different uh, winemakers, often young winemakers experimenting with these indigenous grape varieties, doing lots of really interesting things. And there we go. That's a picture of Moscow filler there. So you see that kind of pinky skin um, from which it's it's fairly easy to, to draw out colour if you want to do so. Right, and now we're moving up to the north to Macedonia, um, where we're going to be looking at Nausta. So Nausta was the first PDO recognised in Greece in 1971, um, and this is a significantly more mountainous area um, than a lot of Greece. It also is a bit further set back from the sea. So there's a little bit less moderation than that we get from, um, from the Aegean, for, for instance. It's also a region that really almost disappeared. So if we go back to the 1960s, there were only 50 hectares of vines planted um, in, in Naosa. And it's really been up to subsequent generations to rehabilitate and revitalize this region. And they, they, they're doing a great job of it. And it's very quickly gained a reputation for producing some of Greece's best quality red wines in particular. So the great variety that they do this with um, is Zino Mavro. So X-I-N-O, Mavro. Um, and Zino Mavro means black acid. Ironically, it produces very pale red wines, but ones with fairly high levels, very high levels, in fact, of acidity. And if you want to understand uh, what Zino Mavro tastes like, but you haven't tried it before, um, you're kind of thinking of something that's a little bit between um, a Nebbiolo from an area like Barolo, for instance, um, or even Norello Mascalese from Sicily. So it's this very pale looking red wine, but with lots of acidity and also incredibly powerful tannin as well. In the past, they used these great varieties. They blended them very widely across Greece um, and they were just used for acidity. But now that we are seeing more production in Naousa and more quality production in this region, we get to enjoy the grape variety for all of its flavors and aromas. So uh, wines made in Naousa from Zeno Mavro have this gorgeous set of red fruit and floral aromatics 
that are often complemented by this sort of savoury underbelly, lots of um, sun-dried tomatoes and dried herbs, you know, I think oregano, that kind of thing. And they age beautifully. And as you age them over time, you get lots of dried uh, red fruit flavours, tobacco, leather, earth, um, and so on. The high level of acidity and the high level of tannin make these grape varieties really well suited to maturation. Um, and this is a region as well that as it has been revitalized, lots of producers are beginning to identify um, the different microclimates that exist within the region of Nausa, um, which give some wines slightly fuller body, some wines slightly lighter body, some wines more fruits, other wines uh, slightly more of this floral character. And that's something to, to look out for. And there are particular producers that are really beginning to spotlight some of their favorite vineyards, um, sometimes made from their, from their oldest vines. I should also say that um, some producers are blending Cinemavra with grapes like Merlot. Now, you won't see the word Nausa on the bottle. Um, Nausa wines must be 100% Zinamavro uh, and made into a red style. But um, Merlot often added in just to soften tannins and enhance the fruity character of the wines in some cases. If we jump over, and by the way, guys, add, uh, there will be time for questions in just a moment. So please, if you have any, put them in the Q&A box and I will do my best to answer them. Um, I have to say as well, so we're going to go over here to Amindio. Now, if you can see on the map there, they're sort of separated. And the reason for that is there's a massive mountain range in between the two, the Amindion Mountains. And, and when I visited in June, I was in Naosa and I, I was going over to um, meet a producer in, um, uh, in Amintio and Google Maps decided to take me over the mountains in my Nissan Micra, um, which barely survived. And in fact, one of the tires didn't. So one of the tips I can give you if you are um, brave enough to, to visit this region and, and the wines are worth doing it is, is please, please, please stick to the highway um, because it's a it's a slightly uh, <laughs> it's a slightly difficult area to to navigate. And the picture here you can see this is in Nausta kind of looking northwest uh, into those mountains uh, last June. Um, and here we go. This was one of the pictures from the trip. And you can see all of the Zinomavro vines um, planted there, along with lots of Zinomavro in the foreground ready to be drunk. But when you go over to the other side, we get to Amintio or Amindio, depending on uh, it's spelled in various different ways. And um, this is on the other side of those mountains. It is at a slightly higher altitude than Nausa on this sort of flat plain, as you can see in the picture there. And as a result of this, it's significantly cooler um, than Nausa. The style of wine produced here is also based on Zinamavro. They make red wines and rosé um, permitted within the, the PDO here. Because of those cooler temperatures, the style of Zinamavro here tends to be lighter bodied with lower levels of tannin. Uh, so the winemakers there being a little bit more careful just to make us a slightly more delicate um, style. But it does retain that elegance and aromatic intensity that you will find on the other side of the mountain, um, albeit with a different structure on the palate. And, and this is particularly the case because a lot of the soil here is quite sandy. And sandy soil is really important because uh, phylloxera, which is this aphid that many of you might be familiar with, um, phylloxera can't spread in sandy soils, which means that you've got significant stocks of old vines that might have otherwise been destroyed when phylloxera arrived in the region. And those old vines, they really lend concentration and complexity to a lot of these wines. I have to say as well that the rosé being produced here is, is lovely. And there are even some producers making white wines from grapes like Assertico and Moscow Filaro, although they will not say Amindio on the label because the PDO is only for red and rosé made with um, made with this in a Mavro. Uh, there is even one producer that I visited. In fact, you can see them. Um, this is uh, them digging their new uh, their new cellar here that's making sparkling wine, traditional method sparkling wine, um, mainly using a Zina Mavro and a Certico, a kind of Blanc de Noir style um, from these grape varieties that are absolutely fantastic. So uh, there's really only one producer doing this called Karanika. Um, and I have to say the wines are fantastic. Um, so please do keep an eye out for them uh, should you see them 
uh, around. Um, but that kind of brings us towards the end of our time. It's a fascinating country. A lot has changed and its reputation hasn't quite caught up yet. So if you are uh, a lover of fine wine, and I'm going to guess if you're coming along to this webinar and listening to me speak, that you probably are. Um, it's, a, it's a place where you can get exceptional value for money, particularly at that top end um, of things. So uh, please do give uh, Greek wine a try in the future. And um, I'm now going to take questions. So I've got to see a few here coming in. Um, so let's have a look here. Um, Amy is asking about the um, process of making Vinsanto. Is the grape drying process similar to that of Amarone? Um, yes and no. They in Amarone, what they'll be doing quite often nowadays is they'll be they'll be um, drying the grapes in these big warehouses because they're worried about rainfall that you can get in the north of the north of Italy. That's less of a problem in Greece. So I suppose it's closer in technique to what you might find in Jerez. To make Pedro Jimenez or in Tuscany where they make a similarly named wine Vin Santo as well. Um, can you spell the variety like Muscat? Yes I can well I think it'd probably be easier for everyone if I just flick back to those grape varieties I think we'll stay back on that slide. Um, there we go so Moscow Filaro is that third grape variety listed there. Lucia, which is the similar Sicilian grape variety cultivated in Naosa. Uh, it, it's called Norello Mascalese. Um, I won't try and spell that for you, unfortunately. Norello Mascalese. Um, and again, it has those very that pale color and that aromatic red fruit intensity that Zinamaro displays very nicely. Can Zinamaro from Naosa be drunk young or will the tannins be too astringent? That's a great question, Paul. Um, so in the in the past, absolutely, it needed a lot of time. However, there are producers now that are deliberately making a much softer style of Zinomavro um, by extracting less tannin from it in the winery. Um, and the result of this is that you can get styles of Zinomavro nowadays that are approachable when they're young. Not only approachable, but really, really enjoyable. Um, and... Uh, a particularly good example of this would be a producer called Themopoulos, a uh, really important producer in the region um, who makes a style of, of, of Zinomavro that is designed to be drunk when it is young. Um, Brian, are there any laws in Greece that re require growers to pick grapes by hand? And that's a great question, Brian. Um, I'm sure within the PDOs themselves, there are some restrictions. Generally speaking, though, we do see quite a lot of machine harvesting on those flat coastal plains. So um, areas in um, the Peloponnese uh, and also in Eastern Macedonia where we're producing much higher volumes. Um, hand har uh, machine harvesting is not an option in places like Santorini because of those basket vines. You wouldn't be able to, um, you wouldn't be able to pick by uh, using machines there. you have to use hand harvesting. Um, Marit asks, what grape varieties do they mostly use for producing sparkling wine? Um, it's uh, it's Assertico and Zinomavro. And the reasons for that is both of those grape varieties can produce very high levels of acidity. I should say that this is a fairly rare, um, um, a, a rare style of wine that's produced in Greece. They don't make a lot of sparkling wine in the grand scheme of things. But as I said, in places like Amintio you are, or Amintio, you are seeing um, a handful of producers do this. Marcus asks, um, what grape varieties, which grape varieties are used to make Retsina? Um, so Roditis and Sabatiano, um, very commonly used to produce um, Retsina. I, I have to say that this is a style of wine that um, people uh, sometimes look down on. Uh, there's lots of high volume Retsina made that, um, I mean, tastes like pine trees essentially, because that's it's flavored with pine resin. Um, however, there are a small number of producers focusing on making much higher quality uh, Retsina. And I've tried a couple and I have to say that I really like the, the flavors and the aromas that it that it brings to the wine. It's got this lovely um, piney freshness that, that I really enjoy, but it is a slightly divisive style. So um, my best recommendation would be to try it for yourself. Um, if there are any other questions, there's a couple more minutes left, so do let me know. A couple of people have asked wine recommendations. 
I have mentioned a few producers, but I, I wouldn't want to single out um, too many in particular. Uh, what I recommend more than anything is get yourself down to a local wine shop and, and ask them what they have in, in the way of their, their Greek wine selection um, and, and give it a try and, and kind of discover a few for yourself. Um, well, if, if there aren't any more questions, thank you um, so much for uh, joining me um, this, this morning or in the afternoon, wherever you are. There is a feedback poll that has just gone up. And if I can just very briefly um, let you guys know that there are some additional webinars coming up in the near future. So if you enjoyed this and you want to learn a little bit more about wine, um, later this week on the 25th of January at 5 p.m. GMT, we have um, a webinar looking at the great variety Jarello, um, which you'll find a lot of in Catalonia with the INCAVI organization. Um, and then uh, the day following that on the 26th, um, we have a webinar talking about studying wine with the, w the, the WSET and what that is like with uh, Christine Kameen and Jason Willis. So if you're looking to learn a little bit more about our qualifications, please do sign up for those. You can find all of the details on the events page of the WSET global website. But uh, if that is everything, then thank you all again very, very much for joining me. And have a lovely day. I will hope to see you again at a webinar in the future very soon. Thanks.